and welcome to another video. This is episode number 27 of the podcast and I think we should just start. <laughs> so, like I said last episode, I believe, I have really been getting into English vintage patterns. I have scoured the internet looking for all different websites where I could find them and it has been a great experience still. I I think this week I rewrote slash redesigned this really beautiful cape pattern that hopefully I'll be able to make this year at some point. I also found some inspiration for a pattern that I'm going to just try and write from scratch myself. I'm using the book that I spoke about last episode. I, I can't <laughs> recall what, what it's called again. Yeah, the, the Knitting Pattern Writing Handbook by Christina McGarth and Sarah Walworth. Yeah, so I've been using that. I'm slowly reading through it and hopefully by the end of this month I'll be able to put out a very comprehensive review of the book. One thing I will say though that I really appreciate about this book is that they give you a very very long list of further reading so that has given me a source of information to dive deep into and find books that will able to help me better understand knitting so that's really cool. Having said that I'd like to move on to the next thing <laughs> that, I, that I want to discuss and that is this cute thingy here. This is done. Ta -da! <laughs> this is another Norwegian baby cap that I knit up. So yeah, just to kind of like recap on, um, yeah, yeah, just to do, do like a tiny recap. The Norwegian baby cap pattern is a free vintage pattern from vintage, no, free vintage knitting.com. It's from the early 60s, I believe. I found it one day and thought it would be really neat to knit this up. And as I was going through the pattern, I thought that I could use some methods that I've learned along the way on my knitting, that I've methods that I've learned on the way on my knitting journey. I thought that I could use those to, I guess, improve or perhaps modernize the, the pattern. So that's something that I have been doing for the past two weeks, I think, at this point. So I decided to use some wool from my stash. This, um, again uses drops napol which is an iron weight yarn 65% wool 35% no 65% alpaca wool and then 35% wool no 65% wool 35% alpaca wool and it has a yardage of 75 meters per 50 grams so i use the colors nature one so 0 100 and marine blue 1709 and then for needle sizes, I used 4.5 millimeters for just the plain sections. And then the color work se sections, I went up to needle sizes, so 5.5 millimeter needles. So the way this is constructed is you start at the bottom and you knit color work flat. Then the sides here, so this section, and this section, um, yeah, you basically you just leave that alone and then you start knitting uh, the back section here. And then some way or the other, you have to attach this back section to the, the side. So that's the construction. Yes, like I said, I have been working on just, I guess, changing, redesigning the pattern. So last week I showed this one right here. This is the first iteration and I spoke about this in depth in the last podcast episode. This one I made a couple of adjustments. 
first thing that I did actually was instead, well, with this one, I did, I first started off with a Pico rib edge, a cast on edge. So it, yeah, yeah. So I started off, I cast it on using the Pico rib cast on method. And that didn't really work because you quite early on in the pattern start working on color work and the sides do flare. And so it's very, you can very easily see the color work on the inside. So the solution was actually just to do the same thing that the original pattern asked for. And that was to first just do a normal cast on. It didn't say what type of cast on, but I just did a regular long till cast on. And then I just did a pico edge after I think six rows of knitting. Yeah. And then here you can see also, I didn't, after doing the, the pico edge, I didn't go straight into the color work. There are a couple of plain rows and here I just straight ahead went into color work. And so that meant that the edge on this side didn't have to be all that long to completely cover this entire strip of color work. So yeah, after essentially finishing off the edges of the cap, I took, I don't know which millimeter hook I used, but I took a crochet hook and then I just single crocheted all across the edge here. Yeah, so the edge of the, yeah, the cast on edge. And then I, I chose, yeah, so I crocheted this together with uh, the upper pearl bump of the last row of the edge. Yes. Yeah, I've, I guess you you call this a brim. I was so because I have been writing this pattern, I have been looking at the terminology of a bonnet. So this is actually called the brim, and then this section here is called the crown, and then the back is called the tip. Yes. So I did all of that, and I really just like how the end result looks like. So after that, I just did the color work and on every section that only uses the main color, I believe I added an extra row just to give me that extra depth, bonnet depth, because I do feel that when, when I wear this one, it does get kind of tight here with my, with the, with the straps. And I just, I just needed a bit more depth. Yeah, so I did that and what else did I do? So the crown of both of these, there's not all that much of, uh, of difference. Really the biggest challenge for me has been the tip, how to do this. So just to kind of like iterate, the original pattern tells you to bind off all the side stitches and then yeah knit the the tip and then at the end seam those two parts together with this one i actually didn't bind off the stitches i decided to turn the tip by knitting the edges of the tip to the live stitches of the crown and sometimes i would knit those together and then knit one more stitch of the crown and that gave me this widening section here. So basically it's the same technique that you would use when turning a heel, doing a French heel or a Dutch heel. So that's how I did this one. I wanted to do something different with this one. Actually, I was thinking of a couple of options and the one I eventually went on to do was like the original pattern requests I bounded binded I bound off yeah I think it's bound I bound off the stitches here of the crown on both sides and then I knit the tip flat and then after doing so I tried 
seaming the two sections together and that actually didn't really look that nice it looked pretty rough to be honest and I just wasn't happy with the result and so I decided maybe I can fix this and just do again a single crochet around the edges so just seam these two parts together using single crochet and I would say that that went okay I tried my best to make it as even as possible but yeah it's definitely not the best work I'm not that proficient when it comes to crocheting anyway but I think this one looks nice enough so yeah this is iteration number two I am going to try and <laughs> knit this one again, as I think also in a different colour. I think I'm gonna try and do some green and white together. And this time I'm keeping this entire section the same. This section worked fabulously. So what I've come up with is that I'm going to bind off a couple of stitches down below here so that the number of stitches on each side of the crown that together equals the number of rows of the tip so that I can again use that technique that you would use with a heel turn for the tip but since I'm binding off already yeah and so in this way I won't run into the same problem as I did with this one where I was knitting the tip and there was still well I would finished knitting the tip here basically and I still had all these live stitches on the crown side so I think that will have solved everything it'll reduce the yeah it'll reduce the amount of length here at the back so that there's more space to leave your hair yeah more space for you to, I don't know, put your bun or your your down do, up do, just the, the, the lower part section of your hair, just, it just leaves space for that. <laughs> so I actually haven't worn this one here on the podcast, so I'll do that right now. My hair is a bit chaotic today in the sense that there's a lot of stuff going on here. So as you can see, there's more space here at the back. I, well, if I really wanted to, like, squish more of my hairdo, the bonnet really covers my ears nicely, and it sits comfortably here below my jaw, more comfortably than this one. So, yeah, the, the fit is just way better, and I'm really happy with it. I think the fit is fine now, so I can... Just quickly also show you how the this one looks, uh, just uh, for you to compare. Honestly, this one isn't bad either. I think this has been such a fun project, so quick to make, so I get a lot of motivation to make another one and improve i just think that this is really really cool and i can't wait to film the tutorial and finish off the pattern i think it's gonna be great and i actually already have another bonnet or head wear type thing that i would like to try and rewrite uh, uh, the pattern form so I just yeah I think this is great also this is for me very very convenient because hats usually with my hair don't really work unless if I have my hair really flat and tight down otherwise it's it's just not gonna work so it's nice having these pieces like hoods bonnets things like that in my wardrobe so that I can keep myself warm, protect my hairdo and doing all of that without completely ruining everything. 
So, yeah, I'm very excited about it. Yes, let's move on to the next project. So, this hasn't been on my podcast for a number of episodes, but it is finally finished. Just have to button up the buttons here. Ta da! Yes! The, I don't know what I call this, the button down polo thing. It's finally done. And I'll try and put a picture up of me wearing it because right now I have other clothes on. But yes, well, maybe I can actually wear it here. So, some specifications. I used for this garment drops flora in the color ice blue that has a yardage of 210 meters per 50 grams which makes this a fingering weight yarn the composition is 65 percent wool and 35 percent alpaca so basically the same as drops napal and i use that in combination with one strand of drops kid silk number seven light sky blue and that is a lace weight yarn, 75% mohair, super kid, yeah, super kid mohair, mohair super kid, and 25% uh, silk, and the yardage is 210 meters per 25 grams. So I have a lot to say about this. Also, I used 4.5 millimeter needles and four millimeter needles yes so yeah to give you yeah so yeah okay <laughs> i drafted this myself so this is i would say my first design so what i did was i did a provisional cast on at the back and then i knit flat all the way up till till well, up till the shoulders and then I used some Japanese short rows to shape the shoulders I knit about three or four rows and then I yeah and then I did the shoulder shaping for the front side and then I knit I did some neck shaping here as well and then I knit down and so when I got to this section here I attached the yarn and so I just knit this all again in one section and then after that I yeah I did a lot of iterations for the polo which I'll go into uh, later on and then I did the shoulders so this was ab an absolute menace it was a menace oh my gosh I made a lot of mistakes and I tried redoing most of them and I think I fixed most of the the problems here for this this vest thingy and I'm at the point where I'm content for for now so yes mm, yeah maybe let me just kind of like recap all of the mistakes so one mistake that I made here was actually after the shoulder shaping, instead of just doing the shoulder shaping of the back and then moving on straight to that of the front, I knit a couple of rows here and that caused the front to be a bit longer. And that's just not good. It's not supposed to be that way. And so I tried fixing it at the back here because I, I realized after I had joined that the front was was just longer so I, I think I added one or two short rows here somewhere but it still didn't completely fix everything so that's something I learned. Uh, the first inter iteration of the collars what I did was I I think yeah I picked up stitches around the neckline and then I knit up increased decreased and then folded 
uh, yeah, I folded the collar. Yeah, so then I whip stitched some live stitches here and I was having issues being consistent. So what I ended up doing was casting off all the stitches of the collar and then whip stitching it onto the body. And then after that, I seamed the side here and it, it was okay. The biggest problem actually was that it was too short. It was just far too short. So instead of taking out the whip stitch and ripping all the way down to half where I folded the collar, I decided to actually open here, this section here, and then pick up stitches and then knit. And I did that and then I, I thought because the back there was not a lot of length at the back. I thought, oh, I think I should also put put some short rows at the back of the collar. And that was not a good idea. The collar became far too long and it was just not great. So I decided to cut the entire collar and then knit back up again. And that's how I got this collar. The only issue was that if I closed it like this, you could see that the it was very uneven. So the one color was on this side here and the other one was just like here. So one color was a bit more to the side. So it kind of looked like, like this, which wasn't a great look. And once I finished, I went to my boyfriend and I just asked him, do you see anything strange? when you look <laughs> at this piece and he pointed out the collar and I was like ah, I, I knew it so I didn't want to re-knit everything even though I was a bit irked by the way this this side curves a bit more in I I didn't want to re re-knit it for I guess a third or a fourth time so after thinking for quite a long time I decided to just cut this all off. And before I did that, I did pick up all of the stitches here. So I cut that off and then I bound off the stitches together on both sides. So it was just a flat strip. And then I repositioned it on the body by just stitching it back on. And that's how it looks more even now. And I am very, very happy with that. So that's everything about the collar, the shoulders. Oh yeah, the button band. I, yeah, so as you can see, the button band is actually not knit separately. What happened was once, <laughs> I think I, I miscalculated something and I ended up with too many stitches on the front but it was enough for me to be able to just fold the fold this section here and then just create a button band in this way so luckily i caught on to that around here so i could rip back to create the the button holes here and then i just did the same for everything all the way down so the last time that you actually saw this one, I had brown buttons and that was because those were the only buttons that I had in my stash. And so I ended up buying these really cute white buttons. I got them from Linda Hobby. One subscriber also suggested going for a cooler tone in buttons for this shirt and they were bang on. I mean, it, it looks way better than the with the brown ones, I think. So that's everything for the body. Yeah, this is the bottom of the body. Kind of, wait. I'll give you the, the, full, the full reveal. Well, let me just show you how it looks because I usually now wear it like this. This is the back. So 
I've spoken about the body and now it's time to move on to the sleeves and these have been again an absolute menace but I have learned so much so I'm actually very happy with that <sighs> the arms I mean if you look I think you you might have already noticed but the sleeves are slightly different so this is the original sleeve that I knit I used a pickup rate of two to three so every three stitches I would pick up two stitches because that's usually the the rate when it comes to vertical and horizontal picking up stitches on the vertical side and I decided to do some shoulder shaping so that I would have a straight arm here and I did that however it kind of looked weird like it kind of bunched up I, I wasn't really liking the way the the arm looked and so I thought okay I'm just gonna leave this one here and then I'm going to try a different pickup rate on the left side so I first did a very extreme pickup rate I can't remember what it was again but I said that I, I explained more in the other episode in any case it was way too tight it started puckering here it just didn't really look good and so I ended up trying out a pickup rate that was smack dab in the middle of the very tight one and this one and it still did not look right and so I was wondering what was going on I definitely it was like the section here the arm sections yeah the here at the armholes it it wasn't looking all that good I think that also had to do with the fact that I did not do any armhole shaping the reason why I didn't do that was because I looked at a couple of vintage patterns and they didn't do any armhole shaping so I thought it would be fine. The construction was also completely different because it was knit bottom up and the sleeves were knit at the same time. Yeah so I, I messed up there and I was thinking about that original construction and I went back and looked at the pattern and then I realized that the way that the arm well the way the sleeves are knit when they go up is that they cast on a number of stitches on the side and then do that on the other side as well and so what happens is that the sleeve like the underarm shaping happens by gradually casting on new stitches and so I thought well probably one of the reasons why it's not looking all too clean on my design is because there's no underarm shaping and so with this arm actually this one looked worse <laughs> before I ended up ripping out this section and then decreasing here below I think you can see the decrease line here and then that's also what I did here the difference between this sleeve and this sleeve is that this sleeve has about seven less stitches I picked up seven less and so now I do feel like I have found a good sleeve for this this whole thing yeah so I also did some short row shaping here which I didn't do for the other sleeves that I knit on on this side and that definitely also helped a lot with the sleeve so yeah if you focus a lot you'll definitely see that these two are different but at the moment I'm just happy to take this entire thing as a W and then maybe at some point I'll go back rip out this section and then re-knit it with seven less stitches. I did make notes on how I knit this sleeve so hopefully I've done that well enough so that maybe in a couple of months or in a couple of years I know how to adjust this one. 
So I am actually very pleased with this one. So I knit this up with silk mohair and wool but I think it would be really nice to yeah have a summer version with cotton so I might try and do that in the next couple of months I just have to think a bit more about it but I think that would be really nice to have in the summer and uh, yeah I think one of you also mentioned that a couple of episodes ago so yeah, very happy with this one. We are on to the next piece. And this is something that I am knitting for my boyfriend. It's the mid-winter sweater. This is a free pattern on Yarbo. Yeah, this is a free pattern from Yarbo. So, yes, let me give you some specifications on this. It's the, like I said, the mid-winter sweater. There are actually two patterns out for this, a version for women and a version for men. I think it would be nice to also come back to the women's version and see what was done to make adjustments. But, yes, so the way this... The sweater is constructed, it's a top-down sweater with a saddle shoulder construction. So what you do is you first cast on. The pattern suggests you to use an Italian cast on, but I just used a long tail cast on just for convenience. So you knit one by one rib for a number of centimeters. I actually modified that, I made it a bit shorter because it's really supposed to be a turtleneck so once you've done that you start working in lice pattern motif yeah you knit the shoulder part so it's just one long strip of shoulder you do that on the left and then you do that on the right and once you've done that you then pick up stitches at the back here so from the shoulder part, you have, uh, well, here you were supposed to have stitches from your ribbing that were left on hold. You pick those up again, you knit, and then you pick up stitches here on this side. And then for the first, I think, yeah, the first three lice rows, yeah, one, two, three, you do some shoulder shaping so the pattern suggests wraps and turns or wrap wrap and turns i don't know what what it is but i just used german short rows for ease again and it turned out great i don't really think you can see exactly where i did them yeah yeah i don't think you can actually see it yeah so i'm very very happy with that and then once you've done the short row shaping, then you just knit down straight. Then you knit all the way down for the arms. And then you put those stitches on hold. And then you start picking up at the front, which is actually what I'm doing at the moment. I have just picked up the stitches along the shoulder here. The what shoulder? The right shoulder. And then... Now I'm going to be moving on to the left shoulder. And then you just knit down, you attach these two sections and then you knit in the round down, do the ribbing, come back up, pick up the stitches around here, do the left and the right sleeve and then you're done. Yeah, in terms of modifications, I've just tried to make this as easy <laughs> for myself as possible so I think I've already mentioned all of the modifications I am planning on knitting the sleeves first before finishing off the body because yeah so I'll so I definitely want the sleeves to be long enough and I'm 100% sure that I have enough yarn but at least I like being able to then later on check how it looks on my boyfriend and then see how much 
yarn he might need at uh, the bottom. Yeah, I, I think that that's, it's just an easier way for, for me to do it. And one thing I do have to say, I'm very happy that I made sure that the collar was really short because my boyfriend actually tried this on and he thought this yarn was so, so scratchy. <laughs> so I was very happy that it didn't all the way creep up all the way to his neck. But I am very happy with how it looks. I'll show a picture here how it looks on him at the moment. Really love the shoulder shaping and it's done in a very, very nice way that really doesn't disrupt the lice pattern at all. I'd highly recommend just checking out this pattern. It's available in English for free, so I'll leave a link in the description box below. Yeah, I forgot to mention the yarn. So this is, I just chose the recommended yarn from the pattern. So this is Yarbo Svensk Ul. This is 100% Swedish wool. It's a worsted weight yarn, 90 meters per 50 grams. As for the needles, I used, well, I'm using now three millimeter needles. The pattern recommends four, but I did a gauge swatch and mine was far too big. So yeah, three millimeter needles are working splendid for me. For the ribbing though, I did two and a half. And what else is there to say about this? Yeah, so last time that I mentioned this, I found a couple of mistakes in the pattern, mainly when it came to short rows and something else that I can't remember. But having knit more and looked longer at the pattern, the rest actually seems quite fine. And I do think that if you have experience knitting. For instance, if you're an intermediate to advanced knitter, I think you'll be able to work your way through this pattern without too many hurdles. Yeah, I think it's looking great. I'm very, very excited to see how it'll look in the end. Oh yeah, also the pattern designer of this sweater is called Stina Hallgaard Johansson. Moving on, I wanted to talk about the easy cable vest pattern. This is again another free pattern on free vintage pattern, no, freevintageknitting.com. So I'll leave a link to that in the description box below. So yeah, I had spoken about this one, I think also in the last podcast episode. Yes, I used drops, napal, 65%. Well, yeah, it's the same drops that I mentioned last time, but then in the color brown, zero, 612 is the code. Again, the same needles, 4.5 millimeters for the regular stuff and then four millimeters for the ribbing. So not that much has happened. I had some issues with the shoulders. Basically, I didn't do the shoulders well. I had done a three needle bind off, but only for this section because I had by mistake already cast off this section at the front so I took that out and then did the full three needle bind off here so I have modified the pattern heavily I have changed the type of cabling I have changed the gauge because the original one was really bulky and I'm just making my way through the rest of this pattern but yes I have also finished doing the edging for the armhole. So the pattern itself says to use a crochet hook and I think do two rows of single crochet. But I thought, you know, maybe an, an well, maybe an applied edge cord, no, maybe an applied eye cord would look very nice as well. So that's what I did. I used a provisional cast on and I just did the applied eye cord all around the vest and then once I came back down I Kitchener stitched 
everything together. I didn't do the best job. But I think it's good. And I am getting better at seaming, which is very exciting. So now the, yeah, the right side is completely done. Well, I still need to do the button band, but I can show you a bit how it looks. It's going to look a bit awkward having a vest on top of a vest. Ooh, that doesn't look good at all, but... <laughs> It's supposed to be very form fitted. So yeah, there's as opposed to this one right here, the armhole depth is huge. And this one is uh, very, very snug here. So it's gonna look like this. There's gonna be some, well, there is already, I don't know, you probably can't see it, but there's a substantial amount of waist shaping. So I'm excited to see how that will work out. But I think it's looking pretty cool. Very excited to see how this goes. I had actually wanted to work on this more this week, but the week just passed by so, so fast. So I only had like two hours or so to work on the the yeah just the seaming here and here one thing that i have realized is that so i am just starting to knit more flat pieces and to seam more and one mistake that i've made which is has been causing me some issues is slipping the first stitch at the start of the the flat section so for the longest time, I was a bit confused when it came to knitting things flat and seaming. I thought it would be fine just to slip the first stitch on every row. But I actually, I was thinking of asking on Reddit, but then I found that someone, I think about two or three years ago, had already asked that question in the knitting Reddit sub, yeah, the knitting subreddit. And the answer was, no, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to slip the first stitch when you're knitting flat and you're going to seam afterwards. Because what happens is you have half the amount of salvage stitches or edge stitches, I mean, and just less to seam with. And so that makes the structure less stable. So that's what happened on this side. And that's also what's going to happen on this side because I slipped the stitches here. But it is a very helpful lesson and I am going to, in the future, just knit the first stitch instead of slipping it. So I think that's everything for this vest. I am definitely aiming on finishing this this month literally i'm i need one and a half days and then this is just done it is quite harsh on my hands i found on my wrists making these cables so maybe i should just look into that a bit and see why that is the case i don't know if that's something that is actually quite normal but yes that's everything with regards to this vest right here then the last thing that I actually would like to talk about is Isago. So I know a lot of people have been wondering if it's Isago or it is Isayer. So if the G is a hard one or not. But I actually have a Japanese book. It's called Eclog. And I believe, yeah, so they use Isago yarn. And... In the book, there's a phonetic pronunciation in Japanese for Isaga, and it says Isaga. So I'm pretty sure that it's with a hard G, because if not, the book in the book it would have said Isaya. So that's my two cents on that. So I'm going to call it Isaga. Yes. So what I wanted to say 
is that I have bit by bit started to become more interested in the company Isager and that kind of started with me looking at well so the thing is that I look at a lot of Japanese patterns and what I've seen is that there's a strong connection between Isager and Japan and it turns out that the co-founders uh, Mariana and Helga both have an interest in Japan, Japanese culture. So there's a lot of collaboration between the two. And so I was slowly in that way getting introduced to their designs. And quite recently, Mariana, she got, yeah, she published A Knitting Life 2. This is the second book in a trilogy that she is writing, which covers her 50 years of work within the knitting industry. And I just, looking at the designs, I was just so impressed. I think they're so intricate, so beautiful, and the patterns are just so beautiful and so inspired. From what I've learned, she has traveled extensively and that really shows in her designs. So I would actually love to try out some of her designs, also of her daughter, because I looked at those as well and they're all so excellent. So having said all that, the last thing that I wanted to mention was that last week on Instagram, I saw that the official Instagram page of Isager actually posted about this project called Isager Archives. So apparently every year they invite a couple of well-known independent designers to use their yarn and design something interesting surrounding a, a theme. Last year, I believe they came out with a collection called Breeze, which as theme had sand and all the pieces were inspired by 1930s, 40s knitted beachwear. And I just thought that that was really cool. Now, this year, they're coming out with Isaga archives. So going back to the start of Isaga, which was, I believe, in 1977, Mariana was, I think, in her early 20s. This is also, by the way, all available on, on the website. So <laughs> if you want to read more about that, it's all there. I'll try and leave a link in, in the description box below. And... What happened was there was this very famous Danish knitwear designer called Orsa Lund Jensen and she kind of like revolutionized knitwear design in the 1960s and 70s. I also believe that she worked with a Danish yarn mill to develop some different types of yarn as well for her projects. So yes. Also, Lind Jensen, very successful, very impressive designs. And unfortunately, she passed away towards the end of the 70s and I believe left her company to Mariana. And that's how Isago essentially started. And so Isago Archives is centered around also Lind Jensen's designs. And so... Yeah, I believe this time eight Danish knitwear designers have, no, 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 not eight, 12, 12 have been asked to look at some of these old pieces designed by Orsa, pick out one and then design something inspired by that specific pattern. And I think that that's such a cool idea. So what's going to happen is as from February the 13th, every couple of days, a new pattern is going to come out. And I'm really excited to see that because it's, I just think it's really cool, you know, because for me, from a historic point of view, I think that's very 
interesting. I would have loved to have seen the original or been able to read through the original designs and see how these modern knitwear designers have changed things around. But yeah, I don't think that's <laughs> going to be possible. But I just think that it's such a cool idea. So I'm very excited to see the finished garments. I have been able to see some sneak peeks because test knitters have been posting about it on Instagram. They haven't shown the complete garments, but you can see snippets here and there and the different color selections. And it just looks so, so interesting. So that's something that I am really excited for. Also I found that next week Daruma is coming out with a new schedule for their releases I believe from February to about April so that's exciting as well. So lots of fun things happening. I'm just very excited. So that's really all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you soon in another video. Bye bye!